Hello, and welcome to Humanities Matter, brought to you by Brill. I'm Lee Chung Greco, and this week we'll be looking at key issues in the field of humanities. I'm speaking with Dr. Robin Atfield. His paper is Africa and Climate Change. Dr. Atfield, thank you so much for speaking with us today. That's a pleasure. Uh, before we get started on your paper, uh, wondering if you can talk to us about your experience living, studying, and working in Africa. Uh, well, that began uh, many years ago in 1972. I was already in post as a lecturer in Britain, but I had the opportunity to teach for a year in Nigeria, um, which was a very good experience, and where, where I found the students uh, very, very positive and responsive. And I found the same when about uh, two and a half years later, I was teaching at the University of Nairobi in Kenya in East Africa. Um, I have also um, visited other parts of Africa at, at one point doing research in South Africa. Um, I've stayed in Zimbabwe and um, be because I have had um, a research student from Ethiopia, I have more recently visited Ethiopia um, both the capital and, and some rural areas. Um, so I would like to say that uh, my impression is that uh, African students are no less bright than, than British students and they're far more responsive. And they are also eager to bring in political reforms and better national policies uh, where possible. Uh, so uh, there, there is great hope for Africa because of uh, simply the people of Africa, and in particular, the students that they um, generate. Sure. And your interest in Ethiopia factors into this paper, so I'd love to talk about that later. Uh, but first sure. off, what about Africa makes its populations more vulnerable to climate change? Well, um, first of all, uh, Africa is particularly vulnerable to various uh, worldwide tr uh, trends with respect to climate change. For example, the growth of deserts um, and also droughts, which are affecting particularly Northern Africa and Southern Africa, and other climate fluctuations, uh, such as heavier rains in some areas, uh, in particular the tropical areas of Africa and the Eastern Highlands, including, in fact, Ethiopia, so um, people there are having to put up with those changes. Um, and that is against a background where there is still sadly widespread poverty and also malnutrition. And there are also tropical diseases. And uh, one of the general effects of climate change is that uh, the vectors of diseases like malaria spread as a result of climate change. And they tend to spread both to higher altitudes and therefore further and uh, to greater heights, um, and also towards the poles. So, uh, in in North Africa, for example, malarial um, vectors are spreading to additional areas, and so there is more malaria to put up with, and also other tropical diseases like dengue fever. So uh, th those are sadly some of the vulnerabilities to climate change, uh, which are coming about um, as we speak. That's really interesting. Malaria is uh, spread by mosquitoes. Is there something about climate change that, uh, you know, helps the population of mosquitoes at all? Yes, uh, it's, it's a world worldwide trend. There are also all kinds of species. Um, change their habitats because uh, the conditions that they were used to spread um, to areas away from the equator and towards the poles. So it's it's a, a feature not far from where I live, where the the, the bird which was the, um, ca um, the, the, the formed the logo of one local country park had actually moved north away from the park. Now the same happens to mosquitoes. Uh, they spread both, both uphill and polewards uh, in both hemispheres. And uh, that, of course, means that they affect more people. So there is a risk that they will be spreading from North Africa to Spain, for example, in due course. Um, so, you, so you're on the ball there. 
Hmm. So it's not just an Africa specific problem there either. Um, it, it is not, but ma- malaria is a massive problem. Um, Africa has the majority of cases of malaria in the world, and it is spreading even there. Uh, we often talk about how climate change is going to exacerbate ongoing issues like the refugee crisis, but climate change often, or climate change also impacts everyday life in significant ways. Can you talk about what's happening to farmers in Ethiopia as well as coastal farmers and fishermen? Um, Yes, sure, but I'd like to take that in two parts because um, uh, as a rapid look at an atlas would show, um, coastal farmers and fishermen are in other countries and Ethiopia nowadays has no coasts. It, It used to at one time before Eritrea became independent. So um, coastal farmers um, have the problem that their land is quite often flooded and becomes saline and therefore it is harder to grow crops. And coastal fishermen have the problem that um, coral reefs are being harmed and they are the nurseries for fish. And so there are fewer fish um, as a result of that. And also um, mangrove swamps are receding and uh, they too are nurseries for fish and this also um, has an adverse impact on on fisheries. So there are some um, examples of impacts on coastal farmers and fishermen and and this is people who have not yet had to migrate but uh, are having problems making a living where they are. Let's now move to the core of your question. So that concerned farmers in rural Ethiopia and um, I'm, I, I'm deriving what I'm just going to say from an article by um, one Colin McQuiston in the journal Small World um, Practical Action. And he relates that in parts of, of rural Ethiopia, there are short rains and there are long rains and climate change is affecting the short rains, uh, which would normally be from February to May. And they are starting later and um, when they start, they start um, not not as as uh, the sort of um, drizzle or light rain that Britain is used to, but as a deluge. And deluges, um, instead of saturating the ground, tend to run off parched ground, leaving it parched. And this gives the farmers problems about um, growing their crops. So um, they can't grow what they used to grow in the sh- period of the short rain. So they have to decide in the period of the, of the long rains, which is the second half of the year, um, whether they should um, grow the vegetables that they used to grow in the period of the short rains or maize as in the period of the long rains. So um, for, for reasons of income and feeding themselves base, the, their basic uh, staple food, they grow maize and are neglecting the growth of vegetables. And this means in turn that they and their families are getting uh, few, uh, fewer minerals and fewer vitamins, and that can lead to malnutrition. So that, that is um, an effect of the increased rainfall, um, but the, a different timing of the rainfall, which is a, a result of climate change in rural Ethiopia. Uh, so um, that is a problem. It's a problem that can... There are ways. There were ways of remediating it, um, but um, it is a problem. What are some of those ways you could remediate it? Uh, especially, I'm thinking of those coastal farmers where uh, essentially the soil gets more salinity, gets more salt in it, and you know, as, as we know from sort of these ancient stories of people salting the earth, that's how you kill soil and kill crops. Uh, Is there anything that they can do in the meantime to mitigate uh, these really terrible effects of climate change? Well, there are lots of ways of mitigating most kinds of climate change. I personally don't actually know how you mitigate saline soil, except that the Dutch managed it um, when they um, made parts of the North Sea into polders. Um, and uh, what I believe they had to do there uh, was was to um, borrow the services of millions of worms, which uh, changed the soil from being saline to non-saline, but it took some years. Uh, so there are ways of coping with that, but um, 
I don't know actually what you do if you're an, an African farmer um, um, with with some saline land. Uh, if, however, you you are um, an inland farmer um, with with problems of say drought, then there are definite ways of um, remediating that, uh, which is to grow drought resistant crops, for example. Um, and there are drought resistant strains uh, now of maize. And also, as I read yesterday somewhere, drought resistant grains of sunflowers. So that can help. Um, and also there is drought remediation as a policy in, in various countries, such as Botswana, um, to, uh, but which involves uh, using windbreaks, uh, which shows that there is wind, which can be um, also used in other ways for generating electricity. But to come back to um, remediation of um, problems like droughts, uh, there are several different ways in which this can be done, um, some of which uh, involve national policies uh, and um, national policies are gradually moving around to implementing some of these schemes, but are doing so um, rather slowly and grindingly. And um, they could do with, with um, better integration. Um, we are, after all, trying to, to deal with problems of, of um, bringing in sustainable development and problems of adaptation at the same time. And um, countries need to think through ways of integrating those matters as well as pursuing each of them. Shifting away from uh, the farmers in Ethiopia, uh, can you talk about existing problems at coastal communities in the Nigerian Delta and on the coast of West and East Africa are facing right now? Yes, I'll try. Um, well, in the Nigerian Delta, uh, th there is a great deal of oil pollution, um, and this has affected politics and protests uh, as well. Um, and this uh, this pollution of, of, uh, has both polluted the land, which makes it more difficult to farm there, and um, and waterways, which has adversely affected fishing there, um, and. Um, this is one reason why a lot of people put, try to put pressure on oil companies such as Shell to, to, uh, to reduce the pollution and, and to introduce some um, ways of restoring um, land and fisheries that are, that are lost. Let's turn to what you were saying about the coasts of West and East Africa. On both of those coasts, there are um, mangroves which have been affected adversely by climate change. Um, but mangroves turn out to be coastal defences, among other things, as well as nurseries of fish. And the restoration of mangroves is one of the ways in, in which um, matters can, can be um, improved or reinstated. Uh, there are also particular problems, and East Africa is a specific example of this, um, where Western companies have... Um, decided to um, dump toxic waste products. Um, and um, this has, has had particularly unfortunate results um, in Somalia. Uh, there, were, there were dumps in, in um, canisters um, left a mile or so off the coast of uh, Somalia at a time when Somalia had no government. And they were just left there and did no particular damage until, unfortunately, um, the, the tsunami, um, the Boxing Day tsunami, I've forgotten which year, um, sent a huge tidal wave across the Indian Ocean and broke open the canisters um, quite some years after they'd been put there and led to all sorts of um, toxic impacts on the coast, including... Um, probably the origin of uh, cl clusters of cancer to be found on, among those coastal communities. And it's going to take many years to uh, to remediate all that. So that's that's what I can tell you about the, the issues for the coasts of West and of East Africa. Mm -hmm. um, what role can African countries play in the Paris Climate Accords? 
Right. Well, the Paris Climate Accord was uh, was 2015, and s- since then there has been um, a little progress, but the, the much more progress is needed. We now realise that um, um, to, to, uh, a ceiling to um, uh, climate change of two degrees centigrade is not good enough, um, though it's hard itself to attain. Uh, if we're to, to prevent small islands being inundated and coasts being inundated, we, we need to try to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And um, African countries can play a role in that. Um, they can um, set examples by that through, through their own com- commitments, but more particularly, they can lobby um, Western countries and other countries which contribute much more than they do to climate change. Um, they can do that by pointing out that they themselves make a fairly minute contribution to, to climate change, but they're among the main victims. And um, they're not alone in that, but they could join the other states, such as the Association of Small Island States, uh, which has been quite effective in, in lobbying and um, has managed to um, persuade the, the, the cluster of third world states to be quite effective in um, bringing about agreements such as the Paris Agreement. But more is needed, so the role that African countries could play in the forthcoming uh, COP, that's Con- Conference of the Parties, um, which was to have taken place this year, but has been t- displaced till next year, um, postponed till next year, COP26, they can play the part of um, pressurising Western and other polluting countries, countries such as China and Japan and India, to um, mitigate their climate emissions um, as a matter of urgency uh, so that um, coastal communities can still be there and small islands can still have some territory. It seems like a lot of these African countries are at a real disadvantage, though. Uh, They're bearing the brunt of a lot of this pollution from major companies. Uh, But then, as you mentioned, uh, they're also not even the biggest contributors to climate change. Um, You mentioned uh, China, Japan, India, the U.S. is also a huge contributor. Um, I'm wondering just what kind of leverage they might have when it comes to uh, playing a role in those climate accords, uh, you know, pressuring larger countries to do their part or to not use Africa as basically a dumping site. Um, well, um, the, some of the leverage that third world countries can, can exercise uh, is, is sheer numbers, uh, such as in, in votes in the United Nations General Assembly, uh, where, the, uh, where, where, where tropical countries of, of, of Asia, Africa and Polynesia are having numerical advantage. Uh, they, they don't, on the whole, have um, enormous financial muscle. But uh, but they 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 have been quite quite influential, um, and in particular the Association of Small Island States has managed to be, so, w- which is a natural ally of um, of African countries with all these problems that we've been mentioning. So um, it, it's it's not out of the question that they can exercise an influence, um, but it is uh, possibly a long road. Um, uh, one of the other situations that Africa is in that makes it a little bit harder to uh, meet those uh, climate change, I guess, benchmarks, whatever you'd like to call them, um, is that African countries need to generate more electricity in order to be more productive. But of course, on the other hand, that could exacerbate climate change, especially if they use fossil fuels. Um, So what could African countries do to increase the amount of electricity they generate without relying on those uh, harmful sources of energy? Well, I very much agree with the premises of your question. And it's not only to increase productivity, it's to to, um, enhance the quality of life of uh, the residents of of those countries. Um, I I once uh, witnessed how uh, in a Nigerian town, uh, there was no electricity after dark. 
and that means that people cannot read books and cannot study and uh, um, a great deal of human potential is is wasted accordingly so there is there really is a need for generating more electricity and so a lot hangs as you were implying on how that is generated because if it was generated from fossil fuels then the, the situation would be much worse now it's not not necessary in africa to generate electricity from fossil fuels because there are plentiful alternative sources of electricity the obvious um method is solar energy and uh there, there is in most most the majority of african countries have have access to to a, in, enormous uh, supplies of sunlight um and um solar energy therefore is one of the main ways that um renewable energy can be generated uh it's it's not not necessary to 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 fill the deserts chock a block with solar panels but uh it can be done more tastefully than that. Um, now, there are other ways. Uh, there is already a lot of hydroelectric generation in Africa, for example, on the Zambezi River at the Huangi Falls. And um, I think there is already an arrangement by which the countries on both sides of the river, that is Zimbabwe and Zambia, um, are able to benefit from that. And there is scope for more um, hydroelectric generation but um, there is also uh, the possibility of resorting to wind power. And um, I was mentioning wind breaks earlier, which shows that there are areas of Africa with a lot of winds. And um, so it would be possible to generate a lot of electricity uh, from windmills, mostly onshore windmills. Um, though offshore ones could be tried as well and can be more productive. Uh, and so, the, so all the these methods uh, can be tried. Also, um, uh, energy can be generated um, offshore from um, wave power. Um, that that requires the right sort of uh, technology being available. So all this can, can be tried um, uh, and, ca and can be increased in the case of what is being done already. But it depends on um, technology transfer from developed countries being made available and it depends on better organized funding being made available now that there is there are there are funds um implicit in the paris accord for uh assisting renewable generation of energy in the third world but um there is there seem to be a multiplicity of funds which are not always well coordinated and so it is um, important that they should be better coordinated and that would then assist African countries. But I think um, one of the things African countries need to do is to, is to actually be persuaded of the importance of renewable energy. And that was one of the um, objectives of, of my writing the article that I wrote. Mm -hmm. It's obviously such an urgent issue and there's so many moving parts here uh, when it comes comes to, you know, just the, the sheer bureaucracy and the different countries and corporations at play. Uh, I'm wondering what about Africa and climate change gives you hope right now? Is there anything else you're seeing um, across Africa that you find interesting or innovative when it comes to adapting or uh, combating climate change? Well, several things. Uh Partly there, there are the, um, the African students who, who, are, who have often become African academics and, and are among the leaders of Africa and their awareness of the problems. So, for example, Pro Professor Wokine Kalbessa in Ethiopia is one of those who are explaining the problems to fellow Africans. Uh, then there are the uh, policies which, which are um, increasingly being introduced. Uh, such as reforestation, which hasn't, which I think I have not yet mentioned, um, but particularly in Ethiopia, as a matter of fact, uh, central and northern Ethiopia have become significantly deforested as a result of fairly recent civil wars. But there is, there are um, huge projects of re reforestation going on, and reforestation serves both to to mitigate climate change and to adapt to the climate change that has taken place already. Um, so whereas there are some losses to forests in some places in Africa, there are deliberate attempts 
to reforest um, much of Africa. And, and then there are these, these various other changes that are already afoot, such as the use of improved varieties of maize and of sunflowers. And there are also um, plans to diversify the crops that have grown. Um, plans such as that encounter resistance from people with uh, traditional habits of farming but uh, they sometimes make headway. So uh, there are all kinds of different ways in which things that are already taking place are contributing to resolving the problems that, um, that Africa has, some of which are, of course, growing. Uh, so I, I have c considerable hope for Africa. And as I say, there are... There are considerable resources. There are resources of, of, of sunlight and of wind and of water power. And uh, there is plenty of, of land um, that has some problems, but uh, let's set those aside for the moment. Uh, and of course, the main resource of, of any continent is its people. And, um, and Africa has, has a, a gr growing abundance of people. And I can tell from talking to you that you're very excited about what students are doing in Africa. So that is great to hear. Um, Dr. Robin Atfield, he is the author of the paper, Africa and Climate Change. Dr. Atfield, thank you again so much for talking with us. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. You are listening to the Humanities Matter podcast. You can find more podcast episodes on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast. <laughs>